If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open. Cause this day's for you Don't you let this opportunity pass by you family this is pastor wendell jones here at changing your mind ministries and so grateful for another sunday this is our passover sunday as we lead into our resurrection sunday this is the super bowl for our church for churches for our faith this is the time that we commemorate the greatest sacrifice ever given to men we ought to be grateful given all that we've gone through with covid and all the related issues we ought to be grateful. Even before we get started, somebody ought to be lifting their hands up and telling Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice 2,000 plus years ago. Thank you for the sacrifice two minutes ago. Thank you for the breath you continue to give to me. Thank you for the love you continue to show to me. Thank you for the forgiveness you continue to give to me. Thank you for the gifts you make available to me. Thank you for the people that you sent into my life. Thank you for the folks who hold up my arms. Thank you for the folks who pray for me in the middle of the night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for my health. Thank you for the air I took for, for granted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus for being so good, so kind, so consistent with us. We thank you for this the season of faith that we're entering into that reminds us just how deep your love goes. We're so grateful that you chased us. And we're so grateful that you wooed us and you courted us and you showed us love before we were able to give it back to you. 
We'll never be able to match what you do for us. We'll never be able to repay what you've done for us. But thank you for not holding an account. But we feel your joy at being able to call us sons and daughters. Master, help me deliver this message. Holy Spirit, you are fully, fully God. I honor you. I praise you. I worship you. Illuminate my mind that I might hear your voice in the midst of all of this, that I will move how you move, say what you say, that we might have the greatest impact in this hour. Thank you for choosing me, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As I said, we are we're going to bring you a message today in anticipation of Resurrection Sunday. This is our this is our Holy Week message. This is our Passover message. Look with me in the Gospel of Matthew. Starting at that 21st chapter and verse 1. We're going to read 11 verses, so be patient with me. And it said this, When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them and sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Even as I was reading that, I was hearing other messages outside of my message that I have for you today, particularly when they got to the point where they laid their coats down. But we're going to get into that. We'll save that for later. <laughs> I want to talk to you from the subject, boss moves. Boss moves. Listen to me. There is a popular term thrown around today in culture. And that's the word boss. Everybody wants to proclaim themselves as being a boss while ignoring that. Listen to me, that most titles are given by those who believe you have earned it. And also given to you by those who believe you can stand up to the responsibilities of that title. We ignore the fact that it's not a title that I can confer onto myself. It is one that is given based on fruit, based on maturity. It's fruit that says you've earned it. It's maturity that says that you can handle it. But that doesn't seem to matter sometimes in life. <laughs> So let's talk about what a boss really is. What is a boss? Listen, the standard definition is one who directs or supervises workers. A boss has people under him or her that the boss supports through leadership. Did y'all get that? I said again, a boss has people under him or her that the boss supports 
through leadership. But you know by now, sometimes the culture decides to hijack a word and bestow upon it its own definition. And so when you really want to try to crack the code of modern <laughs> sayings, we have the benefit of the Urban Dictionary. And so if you go to the Urban Dictionary, it will tell you how the culture has redefined the word balls. The culture says that a boss is a person who knows what he or she wants, knows how to get it, and gets it whenever he or she wants. Hmm. There's a marked difference in those two definitions. One is a person who has people under them that he or she supports through leadership. The other is a person who knows what he wants, knows how to get what he wants, and gets it whenever he wants. If you contrast the two, you'll begin to see that it's much easier to live up to the cultural definition because the cultural definition does not require people to follow you. The cultural definition does not require you to be responsible for anybody other than yourself. The cultural definition does not require other people to put the title on you. In fact, the culture says it is a self-proclaimed title. I can call myself whatever I want to call myself, regardless of what it traditionally stands for. That's a boss. Traditionally, a boss culturally. So now let's go a little bit further and let's zero in on the title of the sermon. The title of the sermon is Boss Moves. If we were to use the cultural definition first, it would mean that you can make boss moves without considering the impact on others. Because really, it's ultimately about you getting what you want. You're not that concerned about others because I know what I want. I know how to get it and I know when to get it and I'm going to get it. I make boss moves to take care of me. But I'm sure you can tell by my tenor and my tone that I'm trying to pull you back to the more traditional definition of it because that seems to line up with more of how God wants us to think if we were to stick with the standard and traditional definition a boss move would be about listen to me the opportunities for elevation for all those connected to you let me say it again when you make boss moves while pursuing the heart of God, pursuing the character of God, trying to be Christ-like. When you make boss moves, what happens is that you create opportunities for everybody that's connected with you to make moves too. And I, and, and I intentionally listen now because I, I, I want you to understand this because I believe I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to some people that or presently bosses, but I'm also certainly speaking to some people that God is trying to pull into a true boss position. When I describe what a boss move under the traditional banner, I had to use the word opportunities. You create opportunities. You don't create guarantees. You create opportunities for those who are presently connected to you to make moves too. I unfortunately had to say opportunities instead of guarantees because there's a phenomenon that takes place when you make a boss move. If you're truly a boss and you got some people that are there with you, there's this thing that takes place that, that, that whenever you make a move, that move begins to reveal to you who's really with you. 
Because what happens when you make a boss move and you know you're making it in consideration of its impact on others, you're not making it selfishly motivated. You are opening the door, providing opportunities for whoever's with you to go with you to another level. What it begins to reveal to you who is really with you, because if they don't move with you. Better yet, the boss move reveals who's not really with you. You'll discover that they're not with you, not, not from their absence first. That's very apparent down the road, but you'll begin to realize that they're not with you by their conversation. Sometimes it sounds like this. These are the folks that begin to complain and murmur. Like the children in Israel, they begin to say, uh, we, 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 we doing too much. You asking too much of us. And what's interesting to me with that is that operating from the posture of a boss, I realized that I never asked those who are following me to do more than I'm doing. When you have a boss, a godly boss mindset, you only make moves that are beneficial to the people. You only make moves that will make them better. You only make moves that will free them from chains and bondages. You only make moves that will confront trauma and empower them to be free from it. You only make moves that ultimately make us better. Now, in making those moves, we got to endure some things. In making those moves, we got to go through some painful circumstances. In making those moves, we got to deal with some change that requires some vulnerability and some transparency. But on the other side of the move, is the reward and so you as the boss began to realize that if we can just make it through this transitional moment you will see that it was worth whatever you sacrifice because this present sorrow ain't worthy to be compared to the glory that's on the next side of this move but despite you explaining all of that, despite you even demonstrating that, despite you even having a track record of that, listen, bosses, sometimes folks just won't go. And every time you make a move, it exposes to you, reveals to you who's not with you. You're doing too much. How can you ever say you're doing too much? When at the same time, you're asking for more. How can you say you're doing too much? As if you already know what it takes to get there. The audacity of that statement seems to proclaim that I know how to get there and what you're doing presently is too much. If you've never been that free, like I'm trying to take you to, if you've never been that fulfilled, like we're trying to go through, if, if you've never been that anointed, like we're trying to get to, if you've never been that prosperous, like we're trying to get to, how can you dare say to somebody else, it's too much? Because you have no idea what it takes to get there. But speaking to you bosses, I don't want that to break your heart too bad. I don't want it to shock you. Still may break your heart, but I, I'm trying to remove the shock of it. When you make boss moves, it will reveal who's really with you. Mm. Palm Sunday represents Jesus making boss moves. He was making boss moves for the good of those who truly listen. I'm not contradicting what I just said to you. I'm staying in that same vein. He's making boss moves for who? I just told you who's going to go with you. He's making boss moves for those who are truly following him. While also giving us a pattern to follow. Those of us who have been called to be bosses. If you are of the faith, you are called to be a boss. You are called to be a leader that is over some folks, your family, somebody, and you are, uh, are providing through leadership to them to get them through the difficulties of growth, through the difficulties of change, through the difficulties you face to get to the next level and the next level and the next level. Since we have been commissioned by God to go from faith to faith to faith, from glory to glory to glory, it is a commandment of the Father that we grow and increase. And so he's looking for bosses who will help people transition from where they are to where they can be and where they can be and where they can be. But I'm trying to let you know what happens in that position. 
Jesus on Palm Sunday made a major boss move and left us a pattern to follow. See, the vision of Jesus' ministry can be summed up in John 10 and 10. Y'all know that. He warns you first. He says the thief comes to steal and kill. But then he tells you what his mission is. That I come that you might have life and have life to the full or have life more abundantly. He's trying to get you to more, trying to get you to experience all of your capacity. Did you hear that? He's trying to get you to experience all of your capacity. He does not want you to die with stuff untapped inside of you. And so that's the heart of a boss. I'm taking you through this. I know it's difficult to go through this. I know it's difficult to do this assignment. I know it's difficult to come out on Wednesday nights. I know it's difficult to continue to watch the streams while we're in the pandemic. But I'm trying to give you some information to get you to the next place. Just because the world was shut down, your vision shouldn't have been. Just because the world was shut down, your purpose shouldn't have been. God gave us a way to still get this information in you so that you can become the word that's in you. You've had time to nurture the word a little bit more now you're not as busy as you used to be this should have been a season where your attention to the word attention to showing up your timeliness was showing up should have been at a whole nother level if you're trying to make boss moves this ain't just trying to <clears throat> snatch time from you this ain't just trying to wear you out this ain't just trying to treat you like some little group of worker bees it's none of that it's like we are trying to get you to this place that has been predestined by you. And guess what? You're running out of time. You like me, you just turned another year old and things don't work like they used to. Your body's letting you know we're running out of time. So we need to make some moves. Jesus was making moves. To make boss moves. Listen to this. It requires that you take full advantage of your advantages. Hmm. You have to take full advantage of your advantages. I'm just trying to teach you what your advantages are. We've been telling you about how you've been fearfully and wonderfully made the last couple of weeks. We've been talking to you about these wonderful gifts that God has given you. They are your advantages. And so we see Jesus giving us an example of some things that we need to be aware of. The first thing that we needed to be aware of the first boss move, the first thing to be aware of to make a boss move is that you have to recognize, listen, recognize and develop your sensitivity to timing. Timing. Type that in the comment section for me. Don't just type it once. Type it again. Type it a third time. Just make sure it sinks down in you. I have to be. As a matter of fact, write this, I have to be sensitive to timing, timing. Timing is about when things are aligned, aligned just right to showcase and to leverage your advantages. Timing, timing. Jesus shows in this text, those 11 verses, that he understands, as a boss, he understands Timing. What do you mean, Pastor? Listen, Jesus decides to lay down his life during the Passover. And I said it like a minute because remember he told him, he said, can't nobody take my life. No man takes my life. I lay it down. Jesus was the one who decided when he was going to lay down his life. What we read in those oh, 11 verses is the Savior not being passive. What you see is the Savior picking a fight. And he picked the right time because all of the circumstances were in alignment that would amplify his message, that would amplify his impact, that would amplify his effect on the people. He didn't pick just some arbitrary time. He says, this got to go down during the Passover. He knew timing. See, Jesus knew that there was going to be a large crowd making their pilgrimage to the holy city, making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem because this was the celebration of the Passover. And so all those Jewish descendants came back to give honor to God and what he did for their forefathers. See, a boss 
in his appreciation for timing and her appreciation for timing wants to make the greatest impact. Doesn't want to just be seen by a few or impact a few. He wants to make the greatest impact at this time because seasons come and go, moments come and go, opportunities come and go. And so when it comes, you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. So he picked the time when he knew people from all the regions he had walked through and ministered through would be on the same road with him on their way to Jerusalem. Timing. Timing is about strengthening your discernment to be able to recognize when God has set a table before you. Mm. And listen, when God sets a table before you, you know what the psalmist says. It's normally in the presence of who? It's in the presence of your enemies. Listen, if, 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 if God has if you believe that God has placed an opportunity before you that we call a table and you don't have any opposition there. I want you to question whether or not it's God. Because God is still trying to make an impact. He's trying to reign on the just and the unjust. He's trying to he's trying to impress those who love you and those who hate you because he loves both crowds. And so he even wants your enemies to see what it's like to be blessed by God. He still wants your enemies to see what it's like to have somebody submitted to the will of God. So he's not really trying to make them look bad. He's trying to he's not trying to, to give you a win over them. He's trying to let them know this is what happens when you fall under the favor of God. He doesn't want folk to show up who just who believe what you believe. He needs some folks who don't believe so they can see the power of his hand on your life. Timing says recognize that table. Hmm. Timing. In the Old Testament, Daniel tells us in Daniel 2 and 21, he talks about God and God's how God handles timing. He says he changes times and seasons he deposes kings and he raises up others timing if you miss your timing you might be one that's deposed but if you get your timing you might be one that's raised up jesus said this is the passover timing he said because what they don't even realize is that they're celebrating me because if you remember the story of the Passover, this was the time in ancient Egypt when God had already sent Moses to deal with the Pharaoh about releasing the children of Israel and he refused. And so at this point in time, God says he's going to send a death angel through Egypt and the death angel is going to kill all the firstborn sons of all people. And he said the only way that the death angel would pass over your place of dwelling as if you took the blood of a lamb and placed it over your doorpost. And so the death angel, when he saw the blood of the lamb, he passed over your house and your sons were saved. That was symbolic of what Jesus would do years later on Calvary. That the blood of the lamb was shed so that you and I would no longer be prisoners of death. That death would just be a transitioning point for us from one dimension to another. It was not the end for us, for those who believe. It was not a place that put us in a lower state, but a place that transitioned us into the presence of the Lord because to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Death was not no longer something to be feared and not just death. <laughs> What Jesus represents for us and his blood is that dead things pass over us. Dead situations pass over us. Dead relationships pass over us. Life sucking things should pass over us because we're under this blood. See, that's what a boss does. A boss puts you in a situation where you stop living beneath yourself, gives you the opportunity to, to, to miss dead things, gives you the opportunity to miss dead thinking and dead relationships and all this other kind of stuff. He teaches you how to live out the glory of God. That's what a boss move does. That's what a real boss is obsessed with. And so Jesus, as a boss, says. The timing is right. Let's go to Jerusalem. We can have the greatest impact now. Boss move number two. 
And boss move number two, watch this. He claims his identity in the face of his enemies. Mm. He claims his identity. This is what a boss does. A boss holds on. She holds on to who she is despite the opposition, despite what those who self-proclaim themselves as your enemy are saying. She holds fast to the identity. Watch this. The identity that they attempt to mock. The identity that they attempt to use against you. Watch this. See, listen. Hmm. Such a boss move by Jesus. Watch this. The religious order of that day, the Jewish religious order of that day did not like Jesus because he was shaking up just that, the order. And so what they tried to do, if you recall, they tried to get the Roman authority to be at odds with Jesus. Because watch this. They were claiming that the people were saying that Jesus was their king, that Jesus was the king of the Jews. And so they were trying to prove that this was an act of insurrection, an act of overthrowing the government, just like what happened in D.C. a couple of weeks, January the 6th. It was an act of insurrection. So they were trying to rattle the cage of the emperor, Tiberius Caesar, and make him upset so he would force Pilate, the local governor, to do something about this insurrectionist. That Jesus is trying to stage a coup. He's trying to stage a takeover. So they kept putting out there that they think he's a king. They think he's a king. And see, sometimes, listen, I've learned this. I, uh, 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 God placed this on my heart a couple weeks ago, and I, I actually posted it on my social media page. And, and, and it was this. He said he posed this question to me. He said, when are you going to think as highly of yourself as your haters do? You're wondering why they people attack you. You're like, who am I to attack? God said, listen, when are you going to believe in yourself as much as your haters do? Because if they did not believe in you, you wouldn't be a thought. You wouldn't be a bother. You wouldn't be a target. He said, when can you at least get your faith up to where their faith is on you, in you? I had to sit down on that one. And so what Jesus is doing, watch this boss move. Listen to this now. They, they got it out in the city that he thinks he's a king. So guess what he does? Two miles outside of the city. He sends his disciples into the city. He said, there's going to be a donkey and a coat. Bring them to me. Ball smooth. Watch this, y'all. See, listen. Jesus understood that it was customary. That kings didn't walk into new cities. Kings rode in. <laughs> Jesus wasn't tired, y'all. He'd already walked from Galilee. He had but two miles left. They've been walking the whole ministry. Two miles outside the city, they say, listen, they want to call me a king? I'm going to be your king. Because I came, I came here. Please don't think I came here for peace. I came here with a sword. I came to shake up some stuff. Since you say that about me, I'm going to live up to your faith in me. Mm. So he rode in like a king would do. But also he put a Jesus spin on it. Because if a king was approaching another kingdom and he's trying to be threatening, he would normally ride in on a war horse. But Jesus came in humbly. He rode in to signify that I am a king. But he rode in to say that my approach to this thing is totally different. Because he cannot clash with his word that he gives to you and me. He tells you and me that this won't be won by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. He said, I didn't come here to take over with my fist. In other words, Jesus said, I'm so good at what I am. I'm so confident in who I am. I come in here lowly and still shake it up. Because I ain't got to beat you down to win. As a matter of fact, there is no competition because he's showing up as who he is. He's showing up in his own identity. Listen, when you show up in your identity, there is no opposition, no true opposition standing against you. Because if anybody's competing with you, they're competing with you for your identity. When they should be trying to be themselves. But Jesus said, I'm going to show you. You want to call me that? I'm going to do that. False move. Because they'll try to take what God calls you and use it against you. 
Tina, I remember starting this thing out, and we're not just starting this thing out. It still goes on today. Oftentimes, I hear people sometimes say, you know, you know, Jones ain't a preacher. He's 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 just a teacher. And that was designed to be insulting. <laughs> because here in the South, you got to be able to tune. You got to be able to tune it up. But it's something about being a boss in your lane. See, what happens is that when you understand that you're a leader, and I know I've been called to be a leader. Not only am I called to be a leader, while I make boss moves, I'm here to build other leaders. And please don't hear that as arrogance. That's identity. <laughs> That's me knowing who I am. I fought too hard to get here. I know who I am. And in the making of leaders, you have to be what Jesus was. Jesus was a disruptive leader. Sometimes you have to come in and shake some things up to make room for some other things that God needs. And so I didn't show up here on a war horse because I'm trying to fight other pastors and fight other ministries. I'm riding in on a donkey. I'm just trying to do my job. Not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of the Lord that's in me. And for those who are called to my voice, called to my teaching, they'll come. If they don't come, I ain't mad. Stay where you are, grow where you are. But in this move, I am to present the gift that I am and the, gift that's, the gifts that are in me and see who shows up. Pulse move. You can't use my identity against me. <laughs> You can't make me feel bad about who God made me. Am I making sense? Boss move. That's boss move number two. Jesus making some good trouble. Boss move number three. Watch this now. Be effective before your moment comes. So that your fruit will speak for you. Mm, mm, mm. I know we started out with timing. Time is going time is going to reveal a moment for you where the stage will be set for you, where the table will be set for you. But listen to me as a boss. You need to be effective at what you do, effective at who God calls you, your identity long before that particular moment comes, because this will happen. Your fruit will speak for you. See, when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was walking along in the pilgrimage of all the other people from all the other cities that he had ministered in, and they knew him. Scripture says they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save us, son of David, because we know who you are. Save us, Jesus, because we know who you are. His fruit was speaking for him. But watch this. When he got to the city of Jerusalem. Look what verse 10 says. And when he entered Jerusalem, all the city stirred and they said, who is this? <laughs> See, now, when you make boss moves, you don't allow your ego to take over. Because in another situation, when you when you got a crowd, which you got some folk who know you, some folk know you over here and you get somewhere and somebody acts like they don't know you, your ego has the potential of taking over. But see, when you're a boss, you're not even worried about that. As a matter of fact. You don't even explain. Because your fruit speaks for you. Mm. Because if you saw in verse 11. The crowd said, oh, this 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 is Jesus. <laughs> this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. This is the seed of David. This is the one we cry Hosanna to. This is the one we believe that can save us. This is our leader. When you've done your job well, because I told you at the very beginning, what is a boss? A true boss is a person that has people up under him under her direction, under her supervision, that she leads through leadership, that she blesses through leadership, that she pours into through leadership. And the people that are connected to you, who have stayed connected with you from move to move, because I told you some will fall off. But those who stay with you, it is evident of your impact on their lives. They have the same strength that you have. So listen, 
If you're following somebody that you declare to be a boss, quit letting people make you feel bad because you sound like your leader. Why? Because I should have the same fruit that my leader has. Quit letting them tell you that you're trying to be a clone or a copy. I'm not trying to copy Wendell Jones. I'm just operating in the principles and I end up getting the same fruit he has. So I should look like him because he's teaching me the principles. Quit letting people try to divide you from the person that you're making moves with. Just want you to get left behind. <laughs> he made a boss move. I ain't got to tell you who I am. Because if I've been effective at my job, my fruit speaks for me. <laughs> if I'm becoming like God, you got to fight off folks trying to make you feel arrogant because you, you recognize your fruit too. God talks the same way. Remember what he told him in the Bible? He said, listen. He said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. He said, my fruit is in my creation. I don't have to wait on you to choose me. He said, my creation declares my worthiness. If you're making the boss moves, you got to be able to stand up under that. And stand up under the opposition that comes with it. Stand up under the attacks that comes with it. Stand up under the ridicule that comes with it. Stand up under the rumors that come with it. Stand up under the people who made previous moves with you, reaching a point where they turn on you. Because watch this. Judas made moves with Jesus. And at some point, he turned on him. That happens to bosses. Sometimes you reach the limits of somebody else's capacity. Mm. And instead of asking you for help, they will try to hinder your movement. They'll try to hold you back, sabotage your efforts, sabotage your name, character, assassination. As a boss, you gotta be ready for that. Mm. As a boss, you gotta be okay when the crowd goes from thousands down to 12 and really only 11 than a possible. <laughs> and still the end result is you still shake up the world, Jesus. You can shake up yours. Passover was one big ball smooth. And it showed me and you how to do the same. I don't want to be a boss by the world standard. There's many things I love about the culture, but this isn't one I'm going to adopt. I want to be this kind of boss. I don't want to be one that just gets what I want when I want, how I want it. Mm -mm. I know me too well that if I take on that mindset, I'm going to end up in a very dark place. I have to be mindful of you. I have to make moves in consideration of you. It is etched on my heart and in my soul to want you to go with me. My move is your move. We should show up with some of the same stuff. I should not be the only blessed person in the church. If I do that, I'm wrong. I'm doing something wrong. We should be a blessed people. Because guess what? As you follow me, take a peek over your shoulder. There's some people following you. Hmm. Scripture says we, we reproduce after our own kind. Boss moves. The takeaway says this. A godly boss leads with others in mind in order that their leadership provides greater opportunities for all who choose to connect with him or her. The ultimate goal is to carry out the desire that Christ died for. And that's so that we might have life and life more abundantly. Are you really a boss? Are you making boss moves? If your goal isn't that we all have life and life more abundantly, you're not making boss moves. If you're not eager, the moment you learn something, the moment you get a revelation, if you're not eager to share it with somebody else and you still have a temptation to hoard it, and keep it to yourself because you want to be above others, you're not making a boss move. 
if all you think about is how you can manipulate, manip manipulate, hook and crook, figure out ways to skirt systems and get around stuff and get over on people, you're not a boss. In fact, you're a prisoner. You're a prisoner of Satan. We should be operating in the same vein as Christ. Christ said, I came to set men free. You ought to say, me too. Whatever Jesus said, me too. Whatever Jesus desired, me too. Whatever Jesus wants for men and women, me too. Me too. The boss wants to set the captives free. As we approach Resurrection Sunday, I want you to make a commitment. I want to be, I want to be a boss. I want to be a godly boss. I want you to trust me with people. Trust me with resources. Trust me with your plans. Trust me with your vision. And just open the door and let me go. Because whatever you desire, God, me too. Me too. Hey, this is the appeal to salvation. No tricks. Just straight talk. You need a savior. If you have not accepted Christ, you need a savior. Not only do you need a savior, he wants you. The tugging at your heart, you feel right now? Scripture says that's God, the Father, pulling at you. Because he says nobody can come to Christ except they be drawn by the Father. That's God the Father hand-picking you. Isn't that incredible? That's how much you matter. So before doubt, confusion, and fear creep back up on you, let's give God a yes and seal you in this thing. So go ahead and repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And because of my faith and because of my confession, the Bible tells me I'm saved right now, forgiven completely. You are my Lord. That means I'm your responsibility. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, teach me everything I need to know, and I will give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Welcome. What a great way to walk into this Passover season. You are part of the crowd that's with Jesus now. You are a believer. I'm excited for you. You need to hook up. Stay, stay. We want to encourage you to stay with us. We are a teaching ministry. We try to make it plain and simple. The easier it is, the easier it is to do and to understand and apply. We'd love to have you. Even if you're not even in this area, you can join us and continue to stream with us. And we pray that one day God will work it out so we can all come together and worship together in person. Speaking of in-person service, CYM, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we will have our first in-person service since we shut down due to COVID. We are practicing um, social distancing protocol. One of those is that you have to register on Eventbrite. For our friends who aren't members of CYM, you have not seen that link yet. We sent the link to our members first because they should have the first right of refusal. But we will put that link out this week for the public. We're trying to hold our capacity at 150, just to be careful and just to learn some things, to see if we can continue to do in-person services after Easter. CYM, I have not decided yet if we will. It would depend on how well we handle Sunday. So please register, listen, you know protocol. If you feel bad, I'm sorry, don't come. Stream with us. If you've been in contact with somebody who's had COVID within the last two weeks, I'm sorry. Please think about the rest of us. Don't come. You will have to wear your mask the entire time. Your temperature will be checked at the door. The seats will be spread apart, but we will still 
be in fellowship under one roof. And I can't wait. I miss you. Can't wait to see you. Before we go, please continue to sow into our ministry. We need your support. We appreciate your support. Support. You can give it through our website at cymm.org forward slash give. Uh, you can give through the GiveLify app. We're out there on that. You can mail to us here at 9 Beth Drive, Greenville, South Carolina, 29609. Or you can use our cash app at dollar sign we are CYM. If you're on Facebook, you can use the donate button. Thank you all so much to my fellow bosses, the godly boss. All right. Allow God to trust you with some people under you because he know you will serve them as if you're under them. Does that make sense? All right, till next time, much love. You get the glory, you get the praise, you take the honor, thank you. You get the glory, you get the praise, you take the honor. Thank you. you get the glory, God. You get the glory. You get all of the praise. You get the praise. You take the honor. You take the honor. We just want to say thank you. Thank you. You get the glory. You get the glory. You get all of the praise. You get the praise. You take the honor. You take the honor. We just want to say thank you. Just 